Okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the committee for uh, organizing this extremely fascinating conference. Um, so, uh, yeah, my presentation is about this particular uh, concentration camp, Vapnyarka, a concentration camp in the Romanian-occupied territory of Transnistria, current-day Ukraine, was founded by the Romanian army in October 1941 after it had concluded the Odessa massacre, killing over 25,000 Jews. In the first and second phases of its existence, the camp saw the deaths of more than 4,000 Jews from typhus and other illnesses, cold and starvation. In the fall of 1942, the fascist Antonescu regime, Nazi Germany's ally in the war in Operation Barbarossa, designated it a camp for communists. Jurisdiction for the camp was transferred from the Governorate of Transnistria to the Ministry of Internal Affairs, making it the only camp in Transnistria to have this status. After the war, those who had been deported there were officially referred to as anti-fascists in most newspapers, during the war trials, and in the public sphere, a term generally attributed by the communist regime to all those perceived or politically deemed as having been the primary victims of the Nazis, thus erasing the ethnic motivation behind fascist crimes, the fact that their targets were mostly Jews. In these communist-created narratives, the deportee's survival in Vapnyarka was primarily credited to the communists' heroic actions. After 1990, with the changing politics of memory and the official condemnation of communism, but also eerily reflecting trends in West Germany where starting in 1956, citizens of communist countries were no longer recognized as victims of Nazism, Vapnyarka, which remained in local memory a camp for communists, was ignored by historians of the Holocaust in Romania. This can only be attributed to their hesitation to engage with lionized figures of the communist past at a time when pressure was exerted for their wholesale denunciation. The politics of memory also affected compensation schemes for the debilitated survivors, hundreds of whom remained with permanent damage. There was also an initiative to classify the survivors as victims of an SS experiment, but documentary proof of this has not yet been found. On September 8, 1942, a group of 407 so-called communist Jews from the Târgujiu political prisoners camp inside Romania and 72 Jews from other prisons were deported to Vapniarka, as well as an additional 544 Jews from various parts of the country who had been arrested at their domiciles for lo by local police. They were deported by train. Eight days later, on September 16, 1942, the about 1,023 Jews finally arrived at Vapniarka, among whom 107 women and five children. Of these were 20 doctors and other medical practitioners. In late August or early September, before this transport of Jews arrived, 150 Jews from Bukovina had been sent to the camp, joining the about 80 Ukrainian Christians who had been imprisoned for various crimes. Uh, since early 1942. In October, several tens of additional Jews were deported to the camp, and from the 1,300 Jews at Vapniarka at the end of 1942, uh, only 479 came from political prisons and the Tirgujiu camp for political pris uh, prisoners, which was a small minority of so-called communists. The communist collective in the above-mentioned political prisons was the center of prison activity and functioned like many informal prison groups organized around interests appealing to mutual aid for its members when necessary. What differentiated the communist collective in informal, uh, from informal prison groups was the hierarchical and strict organization of the leadership and members. The members of the collective were mostly young people who performed the majority of the manual work, the party cell was composed of a limited group of at most 20 individuals who were unknown to the members, while the leadership of the cell were few in number, the most visible, did not participate in physical labor, but rather in planning, particularly in actions, to alleviate the prisoner's suffering. The party cell distributed work tasks to the rest of the prisoners and confiscated any food packages received by the prisoners from their family in the name of the collective, leaving the prisoner with a very small portion. This structure was brought from the prisons to Vapniarka, and according to survivor, Ihiel Benditer, himself deported from Turgujiu, 
to Vapniarka. It functioned as the nucleus around which was organized the resistance and the struggle for survival in the camp. Other survivors claimed that the resistance and survival were due not to the communist collective, which some, like Adelbert Rossinger, accuse of totalitarian methods, but rather to the camp doctor's actions and Jewish-specific mutual aid, all these being assimilated by the concept of anti-fascist resistance in post-war Romania. It is easy to see how any opposition to dehumanizing conditions, including the struggle to just survive, when slated for extermination, can be framed as anti-fascist resistance, first by the fascist regime, then the, by the communist one. But a mere individual will to survive, detached from other forms of resistance, did not exist at Vapniarka, where social life was tightly controlled and organized from within and without. For the case of Vapniarka, the Romanian camp administration imposed a regime of extermination on the Jewish prisoners through the distribution of toxic food, unimaginable deprivations, and physical torture. The lot of deportees were received at the gates of Vapniarka by the commander, uh, Major Murjescu, with this statement, you will get out of here on all fours, if at all. Almost all accounts of the first contact with Vapniarka attest to the greeting that the commander of the camp uttered to the newly arrived deportees, one that remained etched in their memories as an omen of what was to come. Nathan Simon, one of the earliest detainees to be hospitalized in the camp with lower, part, lower, lower body paralysis, even titled his 1993 autobiography after this greeting. But the first challenge the group was faced with before even understanding what Morjesk was referring to was the unlivable condition of the three barracks in which the prisoners were to be placed. The first building was for the women and the children on the second floor and the makeshift hospital on the first. The second building was where the men from the September 16th transport were accommodated and the third building was for the Jewish men brought in August and October as well as the approximately 80 Ukrainian Christian and Soviet detainees. Here in early 1943 would also be accommodated the Romanian Christian common criminals from uh, the Zilava prison in Romania. The camp command permitted the internees to choose a Jewish committee that would deal with the commander. This committee ended up representing all the different groups and social backgrounds of the Jewish prisoner body. In addition, however, the communist collective led from the shadows. They immediately organized work groups to make bunk beds and install windows and doors to protect prisoners from the cold, gathering any leftover materials they found around the camp for this purpose. The novel sources I refer to in this paper are Adelbert Rossinger and Simeon Bugic, along with Ihiel Benditer, Geza Cornish, and Nathan Simeon, who had been deported to Vapniarka from Turgujiu and Romania's prisons, and also Dr. Arthur Kessler, a 29-year-old from Chernovsky in Bukovina. <coughs> Simeon Bugic was an enthusiastic member of the party and even became the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the, late, in the early 1950s. About the camp, Ihiel Benditer wrote, the camp was located in the destroyed buildings of a former military school building uh, built by the Soviets, situated near a forest which extended alongside the railway line. The camp was surrounded by three rows of barbed wire and guard towers every 50 meters. In front were the three pavilions for the detainees and there was an area where uh, roll call was made. On the other side of the ground were two other small buildings which in the past had contained the kitchen and mess hall, the laundry and the showers. In his journal, Adalbert Rosinger wrote in 1977, at both ends of the building were separate rooms, smaller, where only two to five people were accommodated. These were the members of the communist collective. Also, the prisoners were divided by city and into groups of 100 and further down into groups of 10 to control the typhus epidemic that had ravaged the ghettos of Transnistria and also killed the previous prisoners at Vapniarka. Due to this extraordinarily disciplined regime of hygiene, this third lot did not lose a single prisoner to typhoid. In Ihiel Benditer's 1995 book, he writes, groups for the care of the sick were organized within each community notwithstanding differences of opinion and in instances where there was a threat to the detainees, the communities acted with firm unity in order to alleviate the danger. 
In order to reduce typhoid fever as well as other epidemics, the camp's sanitary conditions and hygiene had to be strictly observed. As a result, many epidemics were avoided and the number of sick did not increase considerably. Dr. Kessler wrote in his journal that he kept in the camp itself that the Ukrainian prisoners that had already been in Vaknyarka since May 1942 were receiving 200 grams of peas per day and 200 grams of bread plus food they were able to procure from town until the arrival of the Jews lot in September. And thereafter, all detainees started to receive 400 grams of peas per day and the same 200 grams of bread a detail that affected the rapidity with which the Jewish detainees developed symptoms. The first case of paralysis was a Ukrainian in November, a full five months after his arrival, while the first Jewish case was in December, only two months after his arrival. In early January, Dr. Kessler determined that the specific species of the peas eaten by the inmates was Lathyrus sativus which in quantities of 300 grams per day or more caused various damaging symptoms, in many cases leading to spastic paralysis in the lower part of the body. By May 1943, over 800 of the 1,400 prisoners, mostly Jews and a few Ukrainian Christians, of the camp showed varying degrees of Lathyrism. Most of, the, most of the more severe cases were young Jewish males brought to Vapnyarka from Romania's prisons as Dr. Kessler recorded in his journal. They were already more vulnerable due to the harsh conditions they had already been subjected to. The Lathyrism at Vapnyarka is addressed with more or less attention by each one of the references depending on their personal relation to it and their storytelling goal. Dr. Kessler, being the head doctor in charge of the infirmary or the makeshift hospital and the one to discover the sources of the inmates' illness, logically dedicates the majority of his memoirs to the topic, detailing the symptoms, attempted treatments, and steps taken to change the diet of the internees. He later wrote additional medical texts slowly on the analysis of this particular disease. The Romanian commanders of the camp initially wanted to keep the prisoners completely isolated from the outside world and did not permit them to work outside the camp or receive any packages. They were only able to get information out about their desperate situation by smuggling few notes or letters through guards who took a large fee for the service, more than 30%. But soon the committee managed to convince the governor of Transnistria, who made a visit to Vapnyarka in early, uh, early January 1943, to allow them to work outside the camp. This permitted those who were selected by the collective for work details to meet with local villagers and railroad workers, as well as get access to some additional food. Cornish wrote in his biography from 2000, work at the railway station created an opportunity for us to send news out, thus breaking the silence about life in Vapnyarka. People outside found out about our fate and this was very important. Um, the men that we, um, uh, um, uh, uh, made contact with outside at the train station to un when we were unloading coal, including myself, tried especially to make friends with the guards, and our approach was based on the idea of achieving solidarity between internees and guards, and this political work really bore fruit later on. Nathan Simon, the market, says in his uh, memoirs, the market was held two or three times per week, once I arrived there, I would get a half of bread, 150 grams of bacon, and a liter of milk, which I drank straight out of the bucket. The potato sack weighing 60 kilograms was placed on my back, and then I would walk back to the camp with it. Once Dr. Kessler determined what was causing the debilitating <laughs> symptoms among the prisoners in early January 1943, he tried to convince the commander to change the pea diet. He wrote in his journal, a delegation goes to the commanding officer on duty, Captain Buradescu. We are three physicians and I am elected as spokesperson. In a serious manner, I describe the desperate situation. Hundreds are completely or partially paralyzed, <coughs> lame, helpless, with room temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, without a bed or blankets during the heavy <coughs> Russian winter, terrible hunger, softened through unpalatable bread and occasional supplements of meat from a sick horse. I explained to him that we are prisoners in a camp during wartime, that we may possibly be destroyed through bombing raids or epidemics, but it is 
absolutely against international law and the duty of a state to poison us on purpose. There are already 120 completely lame and another 1,000 on their way. The cause of the toxic pea food um, was, it was the, caused by the pea food. This diet has to be stopped immediately and another form of nutrition has to be introduced. He <coughs> listens calmly with a pinched face and finally replies briefly. How do you know that we are interested in keeping you alive? End of conversation. Nathan Simon, being one of the earliest affected by the paralysis, unsurprisingly devotes long passages to the manifestations of the illness and his state of mind, as well as descriptions of the great deeds of Dr. Kessler, who cared for him in the hospital, not to mention that his book is in fact dedicated to the doctor. Simeon Bugic's 31-page machine-typed memoirs uh, <coughs> written in 1971 refer to the food and its effects on the population on only one page. Dr. Kessler's name, however, does not appear at all, but was only added as a handwritten note on the back of a page at a later date. In these memoirs, Bugic wrote, Later, it became clear that the paralysis was caused by the peas, which were criminally given to us as a daily ration. Our reaction was violent. We, received the f we refused the food. We demanded medical expertise and chemical analysis of the pea fodder. We sent protests to the governor of Transnistria, to the Interior Ministry, and the Red Cross. We requested an inquiry and the punishment <coughs> of the guilty. Throughout his text, Bugic uses the abstract we pronoun when referring to any actions taken in the camp, especially those that improved conditions for the population, thus including himself in all life-saving decisions, even when it was clearly the merit of others, especially Dr. Kessler. In Vapniarka, Bugic was a member of the official Jewish committee, but he was also part of the communist collective. In Benditer's book, two chapters describe in great detail the food, the intention of the commander to exterminate the detainees, the trajectory from the beginning of the illness to the development of its many symptoms, the attempts made primarily by the medical staff headed by Dr. Kessler, whose name is also absent from other accounts written by communists, to help the detainees by writing official memoranda to the camp commander and the acts of resistance that were organized in order to change camp policy. He wrote, the Ministry of Internal Affairs intended to cause a gradual extermination of the detainees through the accumulation of toxins in the body. Alarmed by the proportions and the severity of the illnesses, the doctors addressed memoranda and reports directly to the commander of the camp and insisted that the Jewish committee also formulate urgent requests to, the, to be sent to the commander in order to squelch the wave of sickness. All the requests were rejected with the exception of the opening of a canteen where certain products were available at very high prices. Other names of nurses and doctors appear in some of the autobiographies of survivors and these are a few test and there are also a few testimonies from some of the doctors as well. A nurse, for example, that was particularly appreciated and several testimonies remember her such as this particular one that I'm going to quote from, but also in the drawing made inside the camp by one of the detainees, Gabriel Cohen. And he's the subject of a different research that I have about art made in this particular camp. So the testimony says about her, about Betty, one of the um, uh, large salons that was transformed into a hospital, um, uh, the, the great devotion that was shown by our colleagues, the great devotion that was shown by our colleagues, um, headed by um, Betty Bernstein, made of this infirmary, made of this infirmary um, a light in the darkness. Uh, the organization, solidarity, and medical guidance of the medical staff were credited with the elimination of the typhus epidemic and with improving the living conditions of the prisoners, leading to a very high survival rate. Although multiple survivors died in the years following the war, only about 25 of 1,300 died in captivity from September 1942 to October 1943. What not all testimonies agree on is whether these survival strategies, 
Okay, okay. Um, uh, survival strategies de derived from the specific communist modes of organizing, if they were an inherent aspect of Jewish mutual aid as seen in other ghettos and throughout Jewish history, or if they resulted from the very special makeup of the prisoner population composed of many doctors, intellectuals, and educated political prisoners with previous experience used to implementing strict discipline. As has been attested above, organized resistance against the attempts of the camp officials to exterminate the detainees through food started once the source of the paralysis and the other symptoms of Lazarism were established. It was, in fact, the medical staff, including Dr. Moritz and Dr. Kessler, who recommended that the Jewish committee convince everyone to stop eating the peas until the camp officials change the diet. Benditer wrote, an appeal was made to the wealthier communities to share the little food they had saved. Many opened their little boxes where they had stored the food they had received from home or had brought at the canteen. But they, had, uh, they gave some of this food to the sick in the infirmary. Similarly, those who worked outside of the camp also shared their food. Thus, the deportees were able to refuse the pea brew. For about three weeks, they were able to withstand the hunger pains. The strike culminated when people refused to allow the food to be brought in through the camp gate. This hunger strike is considered by Paul um, Weindling the only example of a successful hunger strike during the Holocaust. However, Dr. Kessler himself characterizes it as such. The majority of the peas returned to the kitchen. There was no strike, but abstinence to the extreme. While Cornish wrote, this is how the outcome of our hunger strike should be perceived. And to emphasize this claim, I quote Colonel Murgescu's answer to a relevant question by Dr. Kessler, the undisputed leader of approximately 20 deported doctors. What makes you think the survival of your people means anything to us? Despite a radical ideological turn in Eastern European countries and an unfettered anti-communism that unfortunately often took the form of right-wing nationalism, the works published after 1990 managed to maintain a balance and not condemn the communist activists of the war period, even when rightly criticizing the post-bellum regime. While personal experience and political beliefs informed storytelling and the narrative thread in all works, including Benditer's, what resounds from all of the authors is that, camp, is that the camp population was saved from epidemics and certain death only through discipline, solidarity, and efficient internal organization. While not all my references attribute these strategies to the clandestine communist collective, some placing more weight on existing traditions of Jewish mutual aid, the actions of the medical staff or of the Jewish committee with its diverse representatives, it is without question that only through solidarity and its practical implementation were the mass majority of the internees able to survive. <laughs>